Hey what is up gamers and welcome to another development log video of my survival game for the NES that I'm apparently still making. As usual you can try out the latest changes by downloading the ROMs uh, for free from the links that are in the description. As I promised I wanted to expand the so called alien beast in my game. You probably won't believe but I spent a lot of time since my last video so I could just add this single room. So what happened? What's so special about it? Let's start from the beginning. Before I started adding this room I noticed that I have a very ugly bug in my game. When you unlock the door in the mine the screen starts flickering while you walk. What's going on there? Well it seemed that the update routine that picks these four door tiles from the list and puts them on the screen was, well, poorly written and way too complex for the NMI. At that moment I just quickly decided to rewrite it so it would be more efficient. And it helped, the flicker disappeared. I then even improved some other things. For example, from now on the checkpoint will save the items inside the storage box. So when the boss kills you, the contents of the chest will be restored back to the previous state before you entered the dark cave. Also the skeleton no longer drops the key if you put the key into the storage box. I fixed the location with the mine entrance so it would react to daytime changes because previously apparently I messed up something and the game started assuming that this location is part of the cave and it was always evening there. I also corrected all the villager dialogues and replaced every mention of a cave to a mine. Then I felt that the location where the bats are spawning is a bit too small, so I expanded it by one screen. I don't know if you ever noticed, but during the night the cold drains hero's warmth points much faster. So now I made that this night freeze would no longer work if you have entered the mine. And if you venture even further to the alien base, the cold should not affect you at all there. Obviously I had to tweak the NPCs that spawned inside the caves. The werewolves were a bit too tough and the second dark location I think spawned only bats. I modified the map system so a location could have both generated and preloaded NPCs. So in the first dark cave location there are still the same werewolves, but sometimes you might find some random bats appearing. After I made all these small improvements, I thought that's it, I should start adding alien based screens. But what should I add? Clearly it would be too boring if it's the same maze like structure when you run past the same enemies and collect the same stuff. I thought what if I could make a room with some sort of a puzzle. This room would lead you to the old alien base, but the exit of this new room would be closed off with multiple doors. And in order to open these doors you would have to activate some kind of a switch combination. But I didn't have any buttons or switches in the game, so how the heck am I supposed to make this work? I figured maybe for this task I should use the destructible tile system that I had. The same one that caused the screen flickering previously. To kick things off I created three two tile wide doors and four tile switch as destructible objects. Of course the switch didn't work yet. So I tried to open all three doors by changing the destructible object statuses with a debugger. This way I could enter the next location. But when I tried to go back I noticed that something is wrong. When something goes wrong like this, I try to comment out parts of my code and see if the problem goes away. In this case the problem appeared only when the map background column was updated. Same as with the previous flickering, this new glitch was happening because the NMI was taking way too long. So long, in fact, it was interrupted by another NMI call at the worst possible moment. This caused some garbage being written to the CHRM. I tried to add a very quick fix for that, so for the time being the CHRM corruption was gone. Then I made that the switch would somewhat work, you needed to hit it. 
I used the same subroutine that was utilized to grab the tiles in front of the player by the hammer code. So if you would attack the switch, it would change its tiles and the door tiles would be changed as well. There was a slight problem though. You could turn the switch on and open the door, but you could not turn it off and close the door. For the puzzles that I had in mind, uh, that was clearly not enough. Unfortunately, my current uh, destructible tile data structure had only single tile value and it was the value after the change. The original tile values were stored in the map data and it was pretty hard to fetch them from there. Sadly, there was an even bigger issue. The annoying map flickering as you walk has returned. No! It was happening because the destructible tile update routine was still too complex for the NMI. Sure, it was fine when there was a single destroyed rock or a four tile door, but this time there were multiple objects and way more tiles. And when I thought that I have enough problems, I found out that I once again filled the main bank completely full. Not to mention the list of the destructible tiles was also in that same bank. So I could not add more tiles for the puzzle, nor could I write logic for it. After some thinking, I decided to rewrite the destructible tile update routine again, but this time to split it into two routines instead. I will write one routine that is more complex and place it inside the main game loop. This routine would iterate through all destructible tiles of that current room and would pick the tiles that need to be updated and would place them into a list that's located in the RAM. The second routine would be very basic. It would just output the data from that RAM list to the PPU during NMI. I thought that I needed at least 30 bytes free in RAM because let's say to draw a single tile I need 3 bytes, 2 bytes for the address and the last one for the value. This could have been a piece of cake, but guess what? I did not have any free space for such RAM buffer. I already filled the RAM full with all kinds of silly one byte long variables that probably could be fit into single bit. So I went through my old code and tried to remove some of these silly variables. Basically some variables only live in certain game states, like the menus or cutscenes. So I can take these variables and put them on top of the gameplay variables. A very good example of this was the villager dialog buffer. It was used to store the villager dialogs that supposed to be displayed on the screen. It was like 96 bytes, so I put bunch of menu and cutscene variables on top of it. This way I gained a lot of free space in RAM. I also decided to rename the destructible tile system to a modifiable tile system, since the tiles are not necessarily destroyed now. To save some space in my modifiable tile buffer, I decided to use 4 bytes for 2 tiles. Because in most cases, objects like doors or rocks are made of more than one tile. So I could save the address of the first tile on the screen into first two bytes and then use two remaining bytes for the two adjacent tile values. And in case if it's an object consisting of only single tile, I could just put 255 into the last byte. In order to save some space in the main bank, I moved the modifiable tile data from there to the banks where the maps of these tiles were located. This way I managed to free up a tiny amount of space to work with. But most importantly, now I can add more modifiable tiles without great limitations. So yeah, I wrote a quite complex update routine that fills the modifiable tile buffer. It's not perfect yet, and <laughs> it had a lot of weird bugs at the beginning. And it updates the tiles a bit too often than it should. I kinda expected that there might be the same problems as before, but to my surprise, after I finished writing the drawing routine, everything worked flawlessly. 
There is no significant lag or flickering. Everything works just fine when you enter the room with multiple doors. The final thing to do was to add remaining switches and make that puzzle. Also added a second tile value to the modifiable tile data structure. So we can easily turn those tiles on and off. So now switches work like they should. Although the switch hit detection is not perfect yet, I clearly will have to work on that in the future. So basically in order to reach the boss, now you will have to use all three switches. I don't think it's a very complicated puzzle, but who knows, I might be wrong. I'm very thankful to it be the hero who discovered that some of the variables in my game overlap with Famous Studios engine variables. So it looks like by playing a bunch of sound effects at once could have created some kind of unwanted effects in the game. It the hero also made a tool that could be used to find similar variable clashes in your game or, or application for the NES. So I've put the link to his project in the description. I know my game's music is kinda crap. So I was really surprised when a YouTuber named SL3DZ made a remix for all the game songs. The link to the full video is also in the description, so check it out and definitely subscribe to this channel. And lastly, I wanted to share that my game was mentioned in a homebrew magazine Brew Otaku issue 3. The review is quite positive, even too positive in my opinion. So if you're interested in homebrew scene or games for old systems, definitely check this magazine out. I've also put the links to the video's description. Well, I guess that's it. As usual, the shoutout goes to the awesome channel members. Retro Sarkas, Tim Beimer, Christopher Wigren and Mr. Kesha. Thank you guys. So yeah, thanks for watching till the end and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye.